All right, my name is Rich Schmidt. I'm here at Anderson Family Vineyard with Cliff and Allison Anderson. It's November 13th, 2019. Thank you both so much for joining us today and for being willing to do this. Uh, we'll start you with the most important question, which is why wine? Uh, I'm gonna get a little long-winded here because the roots are fairly deep. Uh, on my dad's side of the family, uh, they homesteaded on the Oregon-Idaho border back in the 1800s and uh, were farmers and builders and did a lot of different stuff. But my grand grandfather, yeah, that's my grandfather, went down to San Francisco after the earthquake in 1906 mm -hmm. and helped rebuild and liked California and he pulled the family out of Payette, Idaho and, and Ontario, Oregon and took them all down to San Diego, where uh, my grandfather established, in addition to a masonry contracting business, established a, uh, uh, a farming operation. And it was an old-fashioned farm. He had chickens and cattle, and my dad used to have to milk cows every morning, and he wouldn't drink milk for, for his entire <laughs> life because he hated getting up at 4.30 in the morning. And San Diego in those days was very, very rural, and there were a lot of farms. Well, I grew up on a family compound on my grandfather's retirement farm. We had three houses on the property and aunts and uncles and everybody around. And my parents were off working and having kids and stuff. And I spent most of my time hanging around with my grandfather, who was an interesting character. Uh, he had become an organic farmer back in the 1920s, wow. which I suspect his cohort was a handful of people. Mm -hmm. uh, but he, was, he, he wasn't doing it because it was cheaper and he couldn't afford fertilizer. He was doing it because he studied it and he was into it and believed in it. And, uh, so I grew up with him next door. and We had a lot of chickens. And I distinctly remember the smell of chicken manure, making <laughs> compost with my grandfather as a little kid. I mean, I was five or six years old doing this stuff. So the, the farming part of it is probably, I think, where it all sort of began. Uh, and Allison and I have both uh, embraced the organic world and, and, and being as natural as we possibly can in what we do in our in our crop growing and in our wine making. Mm -hmm. um, Allison has an interesting history as well in terms of her family coming out of Texas and having a, your great grandmother uh, chaining herself to the courthouse door <laughs> and women suffragettes, uh, yeah. Dallas as a as a yeah suffragette. Wow, just strong strong people. Um, so, um, I think uh, talking about when we started thinking about wine, mm -hmm. uh, we, he, when he was 16 years old, he got a Scientific and American magazine in San Diego that was talking about fermentation. And so he had the equipment because he was keeping tropical fish, a lot of a, a lot, lot of, of siphon hoses and siphon things. Siphon hoses and things. He could follow their instructions on how to make some wine. Mm -hmm. So he took the Thompson Seasless grapes right off of the table uh, at the family house and, and uh, made it under his bed. <laughs> he said it was terrible, but who? what 16-year-old thinks wine tastes good? <laughs> oh, some do. I mean, actually, our grandson thinks it's great, but... Um, that's, I think that's where he, he's, he's been passionate. And I do say him because when we were at San Diego State, uh, he was uh, going and getting French winemaking books. Uh, we didn't know we were, we were going to be here and do this. Mm -hmm. um, well, when I finished, when I was still studying, he, he had finished, he'd go get winemaking books from France. Um, he just had, he loves to grow stuff and he loves to, he loves to, uh, we love to we t love to take the the fruit. We've made it from every kind of fruit imaginable. <laughs> grapes are the best thing to make wine out of. Good grapes. <laughs> We've tried about everything, um, and we he, he you have to make money to do this. So he earned a, he had a mar market research company for 20 years here in Oregon. Uh, 
Greg Sanderson Research is what it was called. Uh, sold that in 98. Mm -hmm. And then we could do this full time. But it afforded us to be able to do this without any bank help. Mm -hmm. So that's where we feel like we're fortunate. We, uh, we were making wine together in college. Uh, we've made wine from Kits. Uh, Anne, I can't remember her last name, you used to have wine arts on Broadway. I don't know if she's Anne? in our... Anne, it Anne? Anne McCollum, I think her name was, or something. She also had a vineyard in Southern Oregon. But Anne was the, the first version. Wine Arts was the name of the store. It was on Broadway in Portland. And she was kind of the first version of a wine supply operation here in Oregon. Mm -hmm. And uh, we would get various things from her vessels and that sort of thing. Uh, there was quite a loss in the industry. She, as I understand the story, and you may know this better than I do, she was stocking shelves one day, and I think she was in her 80s and fell back on her ladder, hit her head and died. And the industry was sort of left without a source of stuff. I mean, we bought things like canned um, did we get our first press cherry somewhere? concentrate and for our first little funky little presses and yeah. uh, we made wine out of it uh, that I can remember cherries cranberries actually made pretty good wine mm -hmm. um, pears a lot of different stuff yeah uh, kits of frozen Cabernet Sauvignon yeah, from the, California. Yeah, we got frozen grapes, and the, you know what? That wine tastes like frozen grapes. Just, yeah, so you just don't want to do that. It tasted like freezer bread. It's like, yeah, for sure. It's like, no. What's that back taste? What are you tasting yeah, here? Frozen not, grapes. So we, uh, it's not a good idea. We moved up here from California in 73. Is that right? I believe, yeah. Um, between us, when we crossed the border, we had $20 in cash, no credit cards, no jobs. We had been in Oregon quite a bit in graduate school and college, uh, backpacking in the th Three Sisters. Back in the 70s, what a wonderful experience. There was nobody there. Yeah, it was nice. A few people on horseback once in a while, but it was pristine wilderness, no permits, no re no restrictions, no regulations, nothing. It was just it was fantastic for college kids. We really enjoyed it. But we had a bunch of friends in Eugene. We decided... We wanted to move to Oregon. Uh, it's like living in the uh, it's like living in the mountains all the time. Yeah, <laughs> I like, who been, wouldn't want to do that? We had been working together in graduate school on a, a project that was probably funded by the C CIA. In retrospect, where we were doing research, uh, uh, collecting data from the New York Times, which was the considered to be the best universal record of what was going on in the world at the time. So they had correspondence everywhere. Uh, all the instances of political turmoil and government coercion all over the world. You ask me about the Cuban Revolution or the beginnings of the Vietnam War, I tell you a lot. Because we read all of All those stuff. articles. Our job was to read the New York Times and take all that information out of it on, on microfilm. Wow. So we, the two of us were doing that. Which gave us a lot of freedom because yeah. we could do our work Get it, much get it done and, and go backpacking, <laughs> yeah. pretty much. So we did a lot of that. Um, but we got out of graduate school. At, towards the end of graduate school, we had, um, uh, I was, I, we were pretty involved in politics back in the Vietnam War and the Nixon era and all that. And uh, given my academic training, along with one of the professors at San Diego State, we set up a little business that did um, political research. And so we did all the political polling. I was the research director for Southern, Southern California for the George McGovern campaign oh for the Democratic gosh. Party. We're aging ourselves. Yeah, yes. this, is, this, is, this is a long time ago. Mm -hmm. And I, I, we were pretty proud of our success. We t he, was, he was down around 20% support in that very conservative area, Orange County and San Diego mm -hmm. counties. Yeah. Uh, very conservative, a lot of military influence. He was around 20% when we started doing our, our research. And one of the things I discovered in doing political research that politics and marketing and business, selling a can of soup and selling a candidate are not that far apart. Mm -hmm. um, so my only background was really in, in 
social research, consumer research, kind of. I did a lot of attitude, communication stuff when I was in graduate school. My graduate degree is in research social psychology. <laughs> and we got to Oregon without jobs. Um, Would have moved to Eugene. Because that was the mecca, mecca of the hippieism. But it was full but of there's kids no jobs. And no jobs. <laughs> so we came up to Portland. Portland. So Allison started out pumping gas. Uh -huh. I started out working as a bull rigger in the shipyards. Oh man! Um, with a graduate degree, and that was pretty good because the pay was good in the shipyards. Then I went to work in a meat warehouse for Safeway over in Clackamas. Hated that job. Swing shift. It was cold. It was. Uh, it, I didn't go. I didn't work that hard in school to be working in a meat warehouse. So I worked there for a while. The gas prices came along, and Allison, uh, I, I, you probably tell the story better than I can. But my understanding was they asked you if you went to college, and you said yes. So they, they moved me to the office, but and they took her off the off yeah. the pump block. Yeah. Um, and I, so I was allocating ga ga gasoline at that time, so stations would call us to see if they could get gas. So, so here she had a lot is, of power. <laughs> here she is. Here she is, an executive working downtown for Standard Oil for Chevron, mm -hmm. making a lot more money than I was throwing around beef. Yeah, size. so I was a breadwinner. So quit <laughs> and go look for a real job. So um, I, I had experience in the survey research stuff that I've been doing politically down in California. So there were a couple of guys down in Johns Landing uh, who had set up uh, a little market research company and they, they were, they had a business background. I had none. I had no idea, you know, politics, re I knew research, I knew how to crunch numbers, do multivariate analysis, statistics, program computers, all of that kind of stuff. Um, but I didn't, I didn't know business. But I, I talked to these guys, and they seemed to think that I could add something to what they were doing. And we developed a bunch of pretty cool techniques. And then uh, they kind of pulled their operation to Seattle, and I spun out and formed a research company with a partner. And we made this, and this was in the late 70s. And I'm going to go back and talk about wine a little bit in this era, but just to give you some background on what, where we came from. So this is the late 70s, we're starting to have children, we still don't have any money, uh, you know, enough to get by, but, uh, you know, we, we'd bought our, we bought our first house in southeast Portland for $8,001, which I remember really well. And it was one of those houses that you go in with a fire hose and a, and a shovel, which we did. And I was responsible for having to clean up the bathroom, <laughs> I remember that. Mm -hmm. Well, his dad would come and help us. Yeah, so. my dad was a retired contractor, and he he came in and built fireplaces and did floors, and he did. He really, redid everything for us. Yeah, he really fixed it. Up we just had so. to buy the parts. It was we, pretty we didn't realize how, how how big a deal that was. Yeah. So anyway, um, in the late seventies, I spun out of that research company, and with another partner, we started. A, 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 and a I was home raising kids. A different company. And um, we, were, we were doing quite a bit of research for Tektronix, which was a big tech influence around here back in those days. A place where Dick, Dick, Dickie Urath came mm -hmm. from and a lot of people in the industry came out of there, or Intel. Mm -hmm. um, we were having quite a bit of work, success working with Tektronix and we had competition and they were good at they were pretty good at consumer packaged goods and, and banks and funeral homes or whatever else there was to do market research on. And we did a lot of that kind of work, but my partner and I sat down one afternoon and said, you know, we're better at this tech, tech stuff than our competition. It's an area where we seem to get the science mm -hmm. and seem to resonate with engineers. So why don't we focus on technology? That, this was like 1979, 1980. I mean, I guess in retrospect, it didn't take a genius to figure out technology was going somewhere, <laughs> but it kind of did. Okay. And we went from Tektronix, and then one of our first clients that we really had quite a bit of success with was 
the medical products group in McMinnville right in your backyard. Uh, Hewlett Packard had a pretty good operation out there. Mm. And so along with Paul Long, the, the beer guy, we did a bunch of research on products he was developing uh, and then that sort of expanded into a lot of work with Hewlett Packard and we were instrumental in helping them commercialize uh, all the printers, the inkjets and the lasers. Uh, the folks from Tektronix ended up, a lot of the marketing communications people went to this little software company that was starting up in Seattle, um, out in Bellevue actually, what was called, it called Microsoft. Yeah. Um, so it's we three, were three room office. They they were on the third floor of a six story building in Bellevue and they didn't have the entire third floor. <laughs> and there were about I would guess there were twenty four, maybe three dozen of them. They hadn't gone public yet. And uh, they had hired a marketing guy who said um, they had all this money from IBM, right? because they just sold MS-DOS. This, this probably sounds like ancient history to you guys, but like, they had just mm -hmm. sold MS-DOS and um, they had a lot of money and they didn't know what to do with it. And Bill Gates was clearly interested in getting bigger and being successful and dominating the world, evidently. And he was so young. And he's, you know, he was in his 20s. Yeah. Oh. He was early, he was mid-20s, I guess, by then. Mm -hmm. He'd already been down in New Mexico and he was, he was back up in the Northwest. So this marketing guy they hired, a guy named Roland Hansen, said, um, Bill was going, Let, we've got flight simulator, let's make games. We'll do that. You know, it's just like, oh, you know, we know how to do games, we'll do games. And Roland said, well, you know, maybe we ought to figure out what these people want to buy. And so we did probably the very first very painful because it was like less than two percent of the population had ever used a, a, a modern a microcomputer, you know, a PC. Okay. So we had to find those people. And there were no lists or anything. It was just like weeding through the entire U.S. population to find this really small group of people. But we did, and we found. You know, we worked and worked, and we lost so much money on that project. But anyway. <laughs> We worked and worked and worked until we found enough of them to get a statistically reliable sample and, and projectable. And once we got them on the phone, because they were early adopters, they'd stay on the phone with us for an hour because they wanted to talk. They were passionate about it. So we got a lot of really good information. So we go back to Microsoft and say, yes, they play some games once in a while. And they won't pay very much money for it, and that's not what they really need. They need these things which were pretty exotic at the time. I mean, they, a lot of this stuff was news to us. These things called applications, uh, you know, really, uh, yeah. strangely enough, they're, they're, they're using these things called word processors to write books and spreadsheets to do financial analysis and, and data, you know, database stuff, and they want to communicate with email and all that. And Bill looks at that and says, hmm, well, if that's where the... If that's where the business is and what these people need, let's let's go that way. So we were instrumental in, in helping Microsoft uh, really develop that whole strategy and re re uh, orient their business. And we did the same sorts of things at Apple. We killed the first prototype of the Macintosh. I mean, it was a really successful business, and it was fun because we were in on all this new stuff. It was kind of like the modern version of being around. Uh, Henry Ford when he was inventing the automobile. I mean, nobody knew this stuff was going anywhere, or what was going to happen, or how it was going to turn out. Uh, so it was it was pretty exciting. We got to work on a lot of really neat stuff. We had a cli blue chip client list. I mean, IBM, Intel, Microsoft, Hewlett Packard, Dell Computer was a big deal at the time. Cisco, pretty much all of them. Oracle, <laughs> National Semiconductor. I mean, it's just everybody. We had them all, mm -hmm. and um, it was pretty exciting. And we were, you know, I was giving speeches down in Silicon Valley, and uh, you know, it was it was early days, but it was pretty exciting. But we. But in the meantime. But in the mean, yeah, good, good segue. <laughs> in the meantime, we had we had never stopped making wine. It was always our passion. Uh, I want to say that early in the industry here in Oregon. 
in all honesty, I mean, we came from California. We were wine drinkers when we came here. Uh, when we could afford it, we would drink the best wines we could, European or whatever, that we could get our hands on. Which still wasn't really. Which w wasn't that, that expensive, but in those days they weren't as expensive as they are now. So I mean, yeah. But anyway, we um, we were the early industry. It wasn't clear that it was going to succeed. Mm -hmm. It was very unclear whether it was. But in Happy Valley, we have a house that has an acre and a third, and we planted a vineyard in the backyard, and that was one of the best things we ever did because of a learning curve. Because we thought, what the, the heck? Why are people just growing Pinot here? Why don't we have Cabernet? Mm -hmm. What else, what are the what are all the well, varieties we, that we planted we over there? there? There was a garden center down on. Um, yeah, where uh, do you get your grapes too? Uh, down on McLaughlin, called Cash's Garden Center, and they had uh, in they had bare root wine grapes. I don't know why or how or where they got them, mm -hmm. but they had Cabernet Sauvignon, they had Riesling, yeah, Gorge Premier. We planted Premier, all those. Uh, probably 108 Clona Chardonnay and Pinot Noir, which I think yeah, was baby's Yeah, and Mount Scott is 700 foot. Uh, it's affected a lot by the gorge. So it's a really cold site. So it's cold. Clay soil. And um, it, uh, it, that was pretty much my job is to do the garden and take care of the, <laughs> take care of the kids, you know, because he was traveling tons. I was on the road a lot. So um, those grapes, uh, I mean, we picked the leaves. We, we string trimmed. We it, string trimmed. It we did everything. You know, we books. had goats on the other side that would get it if they'd get into the grapes. They'd eat them all. <laughs> it was like we had a farm. We were running a little farm. Yep. But oh my gosh, was it valuable yeah. for when we got serious mm -hmm. about buying this land? Is there are reasons that you plant Pinot? Uh, Cabernet will not get ripe. Not even here. Um, there's very few varieties that will, especially if it was a little cooler there. Um, we never, we, we were able, I think we had that for about eight to ten years, something like that. Yeah. We were able to get Gorge Tremina ripe one time. One time. It, I mean, by ripe, it was like to 20 bricks. Mm -hmm. It wasn't ripe by much. Yeah, and everything yeah. we made from there was marginal. Mm -hmm. it, it was all. So doing this, it was acid. a little bit scary at the beginning because. I had never tasted a good Pinot yet. I have. <laughs> well, I'm just saying uh, they were thin and there was, but, they had a long ways to go. But 1983, it really changed a lot. Uh, mm -hmm, when mm -hmm. the 83 vintage hit in Oregon and nationally, it really put us on the map. I mean, prior to the Druins coming in and all the French influence and everything, 83 was a great vintage year. And we all of a sudden started lighting up. And, and I remember we were going to Fred Meyer and buying California Pinot Noir and California Cabernet and tasting them blind to see if we could tell the difference in the way the ta grapes tasted and trying to learn you know, those differences and stuff. Yep. Um, it so, takes a long time to learn all that, so we're, as we're, you guys all know. <laughs> we're out in Happy Valley in a 130-year-old Victorian farmhouse. It was an old homestead house that we found back in the 70s. So we're remodeling this house, and Allison's... I'm work. remodeling it. Yeah, she's doing <laughs> she's, she's better at that. Well, time. his dad his dad taught me a lot, so... Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, so she's working for the city of Happy Valley, I and I was on the planning commission for a little while, and we're trying to keep that area uh, rural. Rural. Back in those days, there were less than a thousand people in what's now called Happy Valley, and when I told people anywhere, yeah, that we lived in Happy Valley, you know, I was the like, "Where's answer that?" Was is that in Oregon? Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. But it was great because. 205, you could jump right on the freeway and be on a, on an airplane in about five minutes. Um, I could get downtown in 15 And, and downtown, place. you know, because there wasn't that many people living mm -hmm. out there. Yeah. Uh, so it really worked out great for, <clears throat> for that for a while. But, it did. But uh, there was, uh, I was on the planning commission, so I went with the mayor to a meeting in downtown Portland 
where a decision was going to be made about where the urban growth boundary was going to be. And, and coming from California, we want to fight any kind of development we, we did can. Not want track and houses. they were like, money, <laughs> money, we've never seen well, it before. And I said, it's, you know, it's not that important. That part, you guys got to save this, you know? But they didn't know. So we're in this meeting, and we're representing Happy Valley, and we're trying to encourage the powers that be. Land Conservation Development Commission, all those guys, Neil Goldschmidt was in the meeting, that we wanted the urban, we wanted to be outside the urban growth boundary. Happy Valley was originally incorporated to not become part of Portland. The whole intention of incorporating is was to keep the development out. Was to keep the development out. Yeah, yeah. And we were getting a lot of pressure to put in six units per acre and all this kind of stuff, and, and we really didn't want to. Uh, we wanted to keep it rural out there. There were historic barns, maybe, you know, anyway. So, in the middle of the meeting, Neil Goldschmidt stood up with a Sharpie on the white, uh, there's a map up on the wall, and he took, drew a line and included Happy Valley. And just Valley. drew right around Happy Valley, broad, Inside right the Oregon Growth Boundary, and that was it. That was the end. That was, we knew, having grown up in California, that that was the end that of our, the end. our little rural paradise with our kids going <laughs> in 4-H and all yeah, the rest. Yeah. So took a uh, while, but so at first we got angry. <laughs> oh, and that's why we bought this property. Yeah, we spent. That is why. Yeah, we were like, okay, we're getting we out said, of here. <laughs> okay, we have a choice. We can either stew here, mm -hmm, be upset, and lose you know all the rural stuff that we chose this place for, or we can find a new place to new go. new rural place. So for three years. <laughs> The two of us, every weekend we had free, dragging the kids around in, in baby seats and all the rest, would go out, and this was mid-80s, we would drive around all over. I mean, we looked a lot of places. We were over Beaver Creek, out at Scappoose, but a lot of it was around right around here. Mm -hmm. And we had... We had a real estate guy. We had... Yeah, we had we tried various real estate people. But we also did a lot of driving. Right? We did a lot of different stuff. But one thing we did have, which was seemed kind of crazy to most people, we had an altimeter with us. We did because, because of the seven hundred foot level. Because we couldn't get things ripe at high elevation, and the climate has changed. You know, being a farmer yeah. and watching the weather and keeping weather records since the 70s here in Oregon. There's but we no, didn't know it would change. There's no question. It's gotten more variable, it's gotten more extreme, and it's gotten warmer, especially at night. I mean, it, 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 I, climate change is a real thing. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> so we were looking for a site where we could get grapes right. Mm -hmm. That was really a, a major motivation. We didn't want to be too high up altitude, but we had sort of conflicting agenda. Allison wanted a great view. I wanted a view. I've got a view in Happy Valley, so I need that view. Yeah, Mount Hood's right in the kitchen window. And it's like, <laughs> yeah, it's like, I need a view. And I thought, well, I'm safe. I can't be that low and have a great view. And I, I, wanted, I wanted to be low enough elevation so we could reliably ripen. Get it ripe, block. yeah. This was a long time, and 30 years ago. <laughs> yeah. So we were sticklers about a lot of it. So we looked at, there's a lot of vineyards around us here that were raw land then. Mm -hmm. Some of it had what uh, our friend the mayor used to call pucker brush, which had been logged off, but it had been grown back a lot, and a lot of blackberries and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. And we never saw anything that we even got close to buying. Um, I think we were originally looking for five or 10 acres. We weren't looking for anything quite as extensive as this. But when we saw this, we swallowed hard. I mean, we still weren't didn't have much money and um, back in those days raw land for vineyards was two thousand dollars an acre roughly this was quite a bit more than that not ten thousand but more mm -hmm. um, and this is 20 acres this this site um, but we there was no question when we saw this, we were the first people that saw it. It was cattle pasture. There was nothing here. 
Um, the harems. We were the first people showing it. Cattle up here. We were the only people that saw it. Wow. Even the neighbors didn't know about it. No. And this is where the view is. I think the herrings really wanted to, um, they were concerned because it had originally been platted as four or five acre lots and people could have built houses up here. And they were farming and they didn't want to see that happen. So, um, when they knew that we were looking for something to plant a vineyard, uh, they were willing to let us look at it. And, uh, they were, Fred and, and Bland Herring were uh, brothers and they were breaking up their business and they, they needed some cash for tax as they pulled their businesses apart, um, their farming business. Uh, so they wanted to sell this off because they couldn't see any, this didn't really have. You can't for farm it for farmers. them. Guys that are growing cherry trees, filberts, strawberries, what else have they grown down there? Uh, plums mm -hmm. and walnuts. Those were all the things they had history with in cattle. This was not a good site. Cattle could be up here for a few hours, a few days, and the grass is gone and it doesn't grow back because it drains too well. There um, was no water up here. Mm -mm. So we, we, negotiated with the herrings and there were a few conditions uh we were it was four hard bargaining. 430 at the top 430 feet of ele elevation we're not real and high here even though it se seems like we are yeah you think you're on top of the world but <laughs> there i go there's my view and i'm low enough so um but i couldn't believe the view it just took my breath away and it still does every day mm -hmm. it it does most people that come up here <laughs> Um, it's really been uh, beautiful that way and it's totally rocky it's an old landslide so the drainage is like spectacular we, we, don't, we never get a puddle up here we didn't know know about the drainage necessarily <clears throat> when we bought it and that was one of the stipulations with the herrings was that it would be okay for us to have somebody come on here with a track hoe and dig pits just so for because for I'd read enough books that I thought you know drainage is a big deal and well we, we came from, and Happy Valley we've got we had a uh, septic tank there so it's not like Surfacing. we haven't been out in the rural before um, it needed to perk well uh, for a lot of different reasons so but we didn't realize that every hole they dug little fist-sized rocks go all the way to the bottom all the way to the bottom so and we think it goes about 500 feet because that's how far the they went for the well they had to so it's pretty amazing we've had three different professional geologists come out here independently tell us it's an old landslide and we've got no evidence otherwise mm -hmm. any of the rocks we've got around here the big rocks for landscaping we had to go off site to get it so just all these things mm -hmm. so anyway <laughs> we we dug the pits all over the hill the herrings got a little concerned because they still had cattle on here and they were concerned they were going to fall in. So we had them filled back pretty quick. But we climbed down to the bottom of all of them and they all had tree roots down in the bottom. And they all had broken rock all the way down. So we knew, and we dug, I don't know, six or eight pits. They were all over the hill. We knew that um, there wasn't any hard pan, there wasn't any clay, uh, that it was all this great drainage. And, I, you know, I've I'd done a lot of reading and a lot of studying and was aware that uh, Burgundy had uh, broken limestone. Well, and, and the, the Grand Cru vineyards. All rocks, that Bordeaux is hard to farm. Is on gravel, you know, all, all the, there's a lot of history of drainage being kind of the key factor. <coughs> but we did, once we purchased the property, run into uh, what we thought was a pretty insurmountable barrier. I was working 60, 70 hours a week running the research company as much as I wanted to get my hands dirty and do all the development of the vineyard and plant it and everything. There was a fair amount of clearing that needed to be done. Most of the property was covered with blackberries. Uh, there were a few... Not too many trees. A few weedy... Uh, there was a 40-acre cherry orchard up the street here that uh, passed Jared Etzel's place uh, that had seeded out around here quite a bit so there are a lot of sort of scrubby wild cherry trees and some big leaf maples and stuff scattered around so there's some trees that need to be a few that need to be it wasn't like we had to log it it had been logged um but there was a lot of clearing and land development need to be done so and i knew i didn't have the time to do all that so we contacted um 
like four different ones. I'm trying to remember four, the names of Mark ones. Benoit, who was one of the founders of Oregon Vineyard Supply. Um, um, Jim Taylor, who used to have, what was it, Five Peaks Vineyard Development yeah. up here. Mm -hmm. And Jack Myers, who had just started his vineyard development business. And um, there might have been one or two others that we talked to. And nobody wanted to do it. Nobody it was would too it. rocky and too steep. Yeah. They said, we don't, we don't develop vineyards on the steeper ground. I mean, there's some of it out there that's 40% slope. Jack, bless his heart. He went, oh, yeah. We'll do it. <laughs> Bring it on. <laughs> it was good. Yeah. So, um, because his place was pretty steep. And I think he was sorry later because he, he, it's cussed, a lot of work. he cussed a blue streak when he was busting up equipment out there. And it was, it was tough, tough to get yeah. a vineyard planted here. Um, that, was, that was quite, quite an experience getting to know Jack. Um, he hadn't left the property before he invited us to join a tasting group that he was starting which we ended up doing, which is really a for great years. experience for us. John Hallison, who uh, John and Diane had Veritas Vineyard, which is now uh, the Corral Creek Vineyard over there, which is now uh, where Chehalem has their operation. That was his. Mm -hmm. uh, Craig Eastman, who was uh, at that time working for a wine distributor locally, but ended up being the marketing guy for a number of years down with Roland Souls at uh, Argyle. Uh, a couple of doctors from OHSU who were uh, massive home winemakers. I mean, to the extent that, that, that some years they probably made more wine than we did early on. Um, anyway, uh, you know, so it's kind of a oh, and Mike Halleck from Carabella and, and the Hammerstads. And the ha yeah, she's commissioner, county commissioner. Oh yeah, and uh, the mayor of mayor yeah, and, uh, Lake Oswego. Lake, Lake Oswego. So yeah. they're a great group. Great we, people. We hung together for I don't know 25, 30 years. We'd meet once a month and mm -hmm. blind taste wines with Jen. The first half of the vineyard. I was actually going through some papers upstairs the other day, and I found uh, a letter that we've got to hold on to from Jack when he. After he got this going, and I was to the point where I could begin to take some of it over, yeah. uh, he took off with one of his girlfriends and spent, I think Cynthia, it was in the letter, I read, I read part of this letter the other day, he, was, he spent about six months in the south of France uh, and had a wonderful time. And he's and an was, artist, so he, he was an art institute. Um, he was a he art was a, T yeah, teacher. The Northwest School. Of um, he dr with his with his letters he'd send us. He'd draw these gorgeous whatever whatever water color, whatever it looked like. We know. didn't get pictures. We got drawings, and I'm going to frame those. Yeah, that's amazing. This had, this had no drawings. It was all. Text. Oh, really? Because I have some with drawings. Yeah. This, yeah, but I did find one of his letters and going through some papers. Anyway, so he spent about six months in France with his girlfriend, and. When he got back from France, he wasn't feeling well, and um, he went through a lot of doctors and stuff, but he ended up having cancer, and um, he lasted, I think, about a year before he, he died. Um, one of the, it's about 10 days, I think, before he passed, his old vineyard at Shampooey, which he'd been more or less unceremoniously kicked out of by his, the people he transacted with after his divorce, uh, it had changed hands. And I made contact with the people who acquired it and said, would it be okay if I brought uh, Jack Myers out, who planted this vineyard, to, he's ill and not expected to, to survive. He, I think he would get some pleasure in seeing his old vineyard uh, before, he, before he goes. So I brought Jack out, pulled him out of his sick bed, and uh, he had a chance to walk around the vineyard a little bit and talk to them about... I, that's what the picture in the book, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah that, that picture in the back of yeah. the uh, Deep Roots book, it, I think it's near the back. Yeah. This, he's sitting with him. This picture was taken that day when we were out there. That mm -hmm. picture right there. 
was taken the day we were out there with the new owners. And I think we were sitting by the Pinot Meunier vine that Jack had propagated from the one he found growing in the woods up there, which was a um, really interesting discovery and one of the things that uh, sort of alerted all of us to the fact that maybe there was something, a wine industry here before the modern one that started up in the 60s. And uh, Jack's story that he told me was he was concerned about this vine when he found it growing in the woods because he thought it was diseased because it had what appeared to be some sort of fungus or mildew or something growing on the leaves. So he took it down to Oregon State and they said, I don't know where you got this because there isn't any of this growing in North America. This is Pinot Meunier, uh, which is you know grown in France, but as far as we know, nobody's ever propagated it here in the U.S. They may have had some down in California, I don't know, but Jack, Jack said no, it had never been around here. Well, they're around Shampui. There's so much history. Yeah. Hmm. So apparently this, is, this was a hangover from the French back in the 1800s mm -hmm. that he found and survived somehow in the woods. That's amazing. So mm -hmm. uh, it is that that day he, he told the story of that vine to the folks who bought the, the vineyard uh, from the people who had been there. And uh, we inherited something else from Jack, and this is something that I don't know if you've included any of this in your, in your archival uh, research, but one of the things I would recommend is that you uh, try to get some history from the early farm worker folks here who are reaching kind of the end of their career. And uh, someone I'd really recommend that you talk to is our current vineyard manager, who was Jack's vineyard manager. His name is Rudy Chavez. Uh, after he worked for Jack, he was the manager for Durant for I think about 10 years and he's been here next year will be his 29th year he planted the vineyard with us so he's been here from the get-go speaks good English uh, and is arguably the original Hispanic uh, I don't know who else was here at the, at the time I know that Jack told stories of trying to find people to help in the vineyard and that there were, in those days, Vietnamese boat people coming in who had some agricultural experience. And there was, they tried using Vietnamese and Laotians and, and day laborers and people off Skid Row and, and farm kids. And I know that uh, my business partner was pretty good friends with the Durants and her kids when they were in high school used to go uh, pick grapes and do vineyard work like Prosoka Blosser and the Durants. The Durants were part of that operation early on. I um, also remember going to lunch with Ken Durant in 1981 uh, at Piccolo Mundo down at John's Landing and him looking me in the eye and saying, you don't want to get into this business. It's really hard well, work. When we told our wine tasting friends we bought a vineyard, they're like, <laughs> Are you sure? Why didn't you, you talk to us first? <laughs> it's like, well, uh, you know what it's like when you have the passion. Yeah. You can't stop yourself. <laughs> so, so tell me about those early years as you were, you got the vineyard planted. It took, obviously took some time to clear and plant. Tell me about the early challenges of, of getting oh. a business off the ground. We had um, the fruit. Uh, it tells you in the books, uh, three years, you'll get fruit. Mm -hmm. And back in those days, there was a publication. And it would, wouldn't cost very much per acre either. There was, yeah. There was a publication, <laughs> the Oregon Wine Growers Guide, that included the purchase of a tractor and the installation of a well and roads and all the infrastructure. I don't think they included farm buildings. But their estimate was about $10,000 an acre to plant a vineyard. What did, it, what did it cost us? Sixty. Okay. Now, so then we didn't do anything cheap, and we planted it dense, and I, you know, I paid twice as much as I should. Oh, he's just really got special wine such and, the, yeah, you know, a bunch of stuff fanatic. like that. But it was, um, like I said, he was reading wine books, French wine making books, uh, and so he was just so. I think he's before his time. Yeah. Because that was really important, um, but uh, the first year we were going to pick uh, the deer. We're getting in here and eating everything, so we had to scrap that. And 
uh, put up a deer fence around the whole place it and electrify it. Took us five um, years before we ever got the any next kind of crop. Yeah, and the next year, we're, we're the day before we're going to pick, uh, the birds all yeah. came. This was 1997. 1997. Way before anybody else had experienced it or had said anything about it. Let's put it that way. So we're like, oh my God, what are all these birds here for? And they're so pretty. These are cedar wax wings and protected $5,000 a bird if you hurt them. Well, anyway, so they, they took everything. We knew that there was there were bird pressure issues. Um, Jim Taylor, the Five Peaks guy, had told us. In fact, we had yeah. some some netting that we used in our little vineyard over in Happy Valley back back in the late '70s and early '80s. Mm -hmm. But we had no idea of, and nobody nobody much was doing that around here. Mm -hmm. um, so we had a little bit of bird netting up, which saved. A, yeah, saved a few Enough, plants, right? A, a little bit. But we couldn't make any pinot that year because no, they took all they took all of shiny. ours. We had a bird scare device out there, and the battery ran down, <laughs> and because we yeah. didn't even have electricity up here. So, so anyway, just, we lost that crop. Yeah. But we so got, we net the whole vineyard now. We got really good good orientation to netting from Grandpa Jim mm -hmm. Marish, Marish up the Red Barn. We used to go up and talk to him a lot. They were great. Um, the herrings down here on the flat, that used to where the filberts are where you come in, that used to all be strawberries. And that was actually uh, Dick Erath's uh, nursery that he used early on before he planted uh, grapes up, up at uh, the, what was Newton Erath Vineyard. Uh, I think so is there anything else about us? I think they some stuff down there too. <laughs> Anyway, back to back to <laughs> back to you. Back to the nineties. Um, we started out just making wine for ourselves. Uh, yep, yep, uh, first yep. vintage we actually made a little bit of wine was ninety seven. We made a little bit of Chardonnay and Pinot. Yeah. With Jack Meyer's help, we made Pinot Noir as well in ninety eight and ninety nine and two thousand mm -hmm. two thousand one. So those there were about four or five years in there we were just making wine for ourselves and we were selling grapes. And it was one it was one barrel of Chard and one barrel of Pinot was what yeah. we were making. Yeah. And without twenty five cases that's so much. We we'll be fine. Much. But we gave a case to everybody that helped us. And it just you know, um, it's amazing how fast twenty five cases will go. <laughs> um, and we didn't realize the first year, which was ninety eight that we were, we were processing it, um, we didn't realize that we needed uh, wine to top with <laughs> yeah the 98 or we wine. saved a little bit but it it wasn't enough and so we had to go buy wine <laughs> to top with and to top with and what wine do you buy to top your special wine with there was a there you was don't a, go cheap so that was a very there expensive was a, there was a case of um argyle Pinot in that 98. Exactly. So which was ours and which was the other, we don't know. But um, now we have tanks for topping. We learned that lesson pretty, so, pretty fast. So we were making wine for ourselves and selling fruit to, at, ver at the very first, to, the, to Amy and David at Westry, and then uh, Eric Hamaker bought pretty much our entire production. And... About 2000, we began. And I was promised that we would sell grapes so and I could never, just live and here never be a winery. and just look at the grapes just and farm. make our own. Mm -hmm. um, but I think we came to the conclusion, both of us, uh, as we've gone along, why we went in the direction we did because uh, we would sell our grapes and then taste the wine made, being made from our grapes, and we would, it, would, it was hard. Mm -hmm because they sometimes they put a vineyard designate on there and it's like oh my god they're not treating our children well, very well and the wines we this were making got be. better i mean we went to chemeca we went to davis we took a lot of coursework mm -hmm. and we had some good good uh friends uh jim prosser jk carrier was a helped us was yeah really really helpful we we're building the winery and thinking about that but we ran into a time period you know i'd sold the research business by then and we were had a little more money to work with and i came to the realization that we were pretty deep into this farming process and 
farming wine grapes is not a profitable enterprise if you do it meticulously. You know, we've got two guys Which we do. working here full time, all the time, and they're well compensated, and they have medical insurance, and you know, it's all, it's pretty expensive. And the way we farm is, is about as costly as it can be. It's a small vineyard, it's a lot of hand work. I mean, there are 31,000 vines out there, and at, on starting right after New Year's, in about six weeks, we have to go out and make about six different hand operations to each one of those 31,000 vines. You do the math, that's a couple hundred thousand things that two people have to do. And it takes skill and it takes quality folks to do that. So we're spending all this money farming and not making any money selling grapes. And then around 2000, 2001, we went through one of these things that we seem to go through periodically in the industry. It's cheaper to plant a vineyard if you don't do it the way we did it. It's cheaper to plant a vineyard than it is to build a winery. Building a winery is very capital intensive. You put a lot of money into equipment and in build, you know, construction, a couple hundred dollars a square foot, maybe it's $300 a square foot now, I'm not sure what the costs are looking like, but it's a lot. And you need a lot of space to make wine, you need a lot of expensive stuff, tanks, barrels, presses, tra I mean, tra you know, it's just, it's, it's, a, it's a money pit. It really, really is. You know, you hear that in the industry and people ignore it because they've got the passion like I did, like we did. <laughs> um, but it truly is. So... We put our own money into it for years. Yeah. So we... 2000, 2001, one of the things that was going on is this cyclical thing I'm talking about where every so often the, the, the vines in the ground get ahead of the industry's capacity to process the fruit. I, in talking to Bill Hatcher, I think that was really kind of his genesis of A to Z was the notion that, hey, there's more, there's more grapes coming online than there is, than there are, for lack of a better term, factories to process mm -hmm. all this produce coming in. And in 2001, people didn't pick some of their grapes because they didn't have anywhere for it to go. Two effects for us. One, it undercuts what you can charge for your very expensive grapes because there's a glut. Mm -hmm. Number two, if you don't have somewhere to go with those grapes, you basically have lost all that investment, a year's investment, which is mm -hmm. over $100,000. So did that ever happen to you? Every year. Well, we, we, no, we always were able to sell our grapes uh, when we needed to sell our grapes, but as insurance, at least this is my logical rationale, probably I had an underlying agenda, I think, that I wanted to make wine commercially, to be honest about it. Um, underlining an agenda. But we felt like to protect ourselves, we needed to have some of that capacity to produce wine. Mm -hmm. So that was kind of our transition into, into winemaking was uh, on a larger scale. And the first year we made three, 400 cases, something like that, not a lot. Yeah, we've gone slow. But we, you know, we were making wine commercially in this space with a with a permit and everything, um, while it was all under construction. Uh, it took about three years to build what we've got here. Uh, we had a, have, have a very good friend who we we're fortunate to have build this with us, uh, a fellow named Marty Knopf, who uh, he has quite a history, interesting history in, Not in too the much. fermentation. Uh, <laughs> he did all the from the very first Bridgeport brewery downtown for Dick Ponzi, all of the iterations of the Ponzi wineries uh, built uh, Belpont with Brian and Jill, the Scott Paul winery, uh, Lemelson. Yeah, and he brought, all, he brought all his knowledge and friendship um, to help us. He and his crew basically lived here pretty much with us for three years while we worked on this thing together, which is great. Mm -hmm. And built some pretty cool stuff, which mm -hmm. we can show you if you're mm -hmm. interested in looking around a little yeah, bit. Absolutely. Um, 
So we we also started selling grapes to Jim Prosser uh, for a vineyard designate in 2002 when J.K. Carrier was still over on Benjamin Road in the in the barn and worked with Jim and Jim was Jim in addition to to by then uh, Jack had had passed on. We had his wake up here with, uh, gosh, Dick Erath was here and a bunch of the early industry people were here. I, th I think Myron was here. Um, it was, it was, uh, you know, it was the right thing to do. But, um, so we started selling some fruit to, to Jim Prosser and working with him and we did, you know, we worked in his winery, we worked on a mobile bottling truck with Jim, we helped do ta uh, barrel tastings and open houses and Worked with Eric Lemelson quite a bit. You know, we were we were pretty involved in, in our in our friends' wineries around here, um, and also involved in, in selling grapes to to a lot of different people. Over the years, uh, our name has been on bottles, and we've sold grapes to J.K. Carrier, Lemelson, Bergstrom, Delancelotti, um, Westry, Hammaker. Sokol Blosser, Patty Green, um, White Rose. <laughs> so there's been quite a few. It's nice to have a reputation. <laughs> Source proof. That you don't have oh, at the beginning. Um, Jimmy Marish, uh, Granville, Jackson, mm. uh, Holstein. Um, I'm mm. probably leaving somebody out, but. It's okay. You know, it's been a lot. It's all right. Um, but. We were, we started making wine. Our first commercial vintage was 2002. By the time we were getting ready to release that wine and try to figure out what we we're going to do commercially, Eric Lemelson had sent um, his New York distributor over here. And these guys show up. It's a weekday. I probably hadn't had a bath in three days or shaved in a while. And That's doing, kind of the look, though, isn't yeah, it, for yeah. wine people? So I was wine, doing farm work people. up here, and these guys show yeah. up, and they're, you know, they're like New York guys with coats and ties and everything. And, and you missed it? You, huh? missed, you missed not wearing a tie and stuff? No, not at all. <laughs> not a bit. You notice I'm wearing one today. No, yeah. Um, they showed up, and they, Eric had sent them over, and they wanted to taste our wine. And I thought, well, why not? Oh, before, though, he swore on his reputation that he is not going to sell to a distributor. I but I wasn't here. I'd also written a business plan, which I still have a copy of, in 2003 that said we were going to be really small and sell everything direct and we were going to go through distribution. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So these guys show up and uh, there were I think three or four of them. And the head guy was doing most of the talking. They asked me a lot of questions about my business life, my former career, and stuff like that. And they found out that I used to, you know, travel to New York a lot. And they were from New York, and, and uh, it have to entertain clients in New York. They didn't say anything during the tasting. But they're tasting through the wines, and you know they're being very taciturn. They don't really say anything. So I'm thinking, well, you know, they probably didn't really like it. Timing good? No, you're fine. Oh, good. Okay. So, um, at the end, the head guy who represented this New York distributor said, we want to buy everything you make. We want all of it. We want all of it. We'll take as much as you can sell us. <coughs> wow. And I said no. I know. Yeah. It's because like, I, I don't sell to my to, guns. Yeah. I was sticking to my guns. I don't sell anything to distributors, and that was good. But and this then, other guy who hadn't introduced himself to that point and had just kind of been in the background said, well, when you were talking to us earlier, you said that you used to have to entertain clients and take them out to dinner in New York and this sort of thing. Where did you used to like to take people? And I said, <laughs> well, my favorite restaurant, it was down in Tribeca, was called Montreche, and um, I think Daniel Belay was the chef there at the time, and it, you know, it was one of the top restaurants in New York. I said, I, you know, if I were t taking people like an Apple computer out and that sort of thing, I would try to go to Montreche if I could get a reservation. And so he pulls his card out and he says, well, I'm the wine buyer for the Myriad Restaurant Group, which owns Montreche, Nobu. Uh, <laughs> and he melted. In San Francisco. <laughs> on the floor. And we want your wine on our list at Montreche. Well, okay. <laughs> That's how easy it was for him to just 
Do that. So at first, it's like <laughs> for several years, our wine basically what little you know if we'd have people up here by appointment and that sort of yeah. thing, but most of it was going to New York. And it was in all the high-end restaurants in New York. But they were paying, uh, what, an $24 eighth, a an bottle eighth, or something? An eighth of what they were selling it for in the restaurant. Yeah, because we went to the restaurants we thinking, oh, boy. We went to oh, 11 boy. Madison Park, right? Best restaurant in the world uh, at times, you know, on the various critics' mm -hmm. judgments or it's whoever makes those fancy. judgments. It's pretty fancy. 11 Mad is still considered one of the best restaurants in the world, mm -hmm. uh, maybe the best in New York. And we're on the wine list there. And Danny Meyer, who owned it at the time, Knew our names. <laughs> Knew who we were and came up and gave us a big hug and said, oh, we just love Gee, how did he know there. that stuff? Well, he was just doing his research. We found out that they, <laughs> later on, there was an article in the New Yorker that, that they actually had a person assigned to do research on everybody who made a reservation. They did an internet search <laughs> so to they find like out personal who they friends, were. Yeah. So you'd feel like you were really, I mean, it was great customer service. I was very impressive. But the thing that impressed us most was when we sat down to, to have dinner, and we looked at the wine list and I see our wine on there, you know, egos going through the ceiling. But it's over 200 bucks a bottle for the wine that they're paying. <laughs> yeah, they're paying $20. $20. For. And it's like, wait a minute. And, you know, your ego only goes so far and you go back. It, so the recession comes along. It's 2007, 2008. We're back in New York. We're meeting with a distributor. And they're saying, well, you know, times are tough. We've had 9-11. That was hard on everybody in New York. And now we've got this recession we need you to reduce your prices and there'd be no way you can't make any money at all we were i went back and did a more thorough you know i was kind of back of the envelope up to that point i went back and did a more thoughtful financial analysis realized we were losing money at the price we were selling wholesale at the time that every bottle we sent to new york was you know you can't run a business for very long that way losing money on everything so we just said you know we got to change our game so instead of doing that, we shifted back, we went back to the original business plan that we'd written back in 2003 and said, okay, what did we start out intending to do? Before we got kind of ego sucked into this distribution thing. And the original plan was to sell direct. And so we said, you know, there's another thing that's been going on because we do a lot of the tasting to ourselves and you know they're mostly by appointment and we're face to face with the customers a lot and if there was one thing I learned I should have learned in 30 years of doing customer research is to listen to the customers because that was the whole point of my business career hmm. and one of the things we were hearing a lot of was why don't you have a wine club and so, we're like well because we didn't come from that generation and we had never so, belonged to a wine club. No, we, said, we're not. You know, we're like, okay, well. That's pretty short-sighted to not have a wine club just because we're not in a wine club. <laughs> People keep asking us for one. <laughs> so we said, okay, let's have. if we're going to do a wine club, let's try to apply some of this marketing intelligence that hopefully we learned over that career and build something that is pretty customer-centric and and works for them and works for us and that's really been from a marketing standpoint that's kind of been the core of our business uh since the recession i think it took us a little while to get it going but uh towards the end of a recession we rolled it out and it's been a it's been pretty successful for us now we've gone from probably realistically two dozen real viable wineries in oregon at the time we bought this property to about 800 listed now. And there are a lot fewer of us that are vertically integrated where we grow our own grapes, we do the farming, we do, I mean, we hand bottle next door, we don't bring in a mobile bottling truck, we never pump anything. I mean, it's all, it's all ridiculously expensive and time consuming. But, you know, the industry is, has really got, you know, we've got virtual labels and people have multiple brands and you've got somebody who, buys the grapes from someone and somebody else makes it and somebody else designs the label and bottles it and then ultimately all they really do is market it mm -hmm. and they're a winery mm -hmm. and you know that's that's well and good uh, but we're kind of the old school ground up european traditional yeah approach Ma making the wine is our first priority mm -hmm. and it's paid off 
the quality, uh, these wines uh, are going from our first commercial, which is 02, all the way to 17. We open them up every year, all, all of it, for our customers. Mm -hmm. And they're still they're still going. We had a wine club event up here in mid August, and we had. And so the way we make the wine. Do you have wine. a picture of that on the on your iPad somewhere? Uh, yeah, but it's down there. That's okay. That's okay. Not that's no no worries. Um, it's just the lineup of the wines is basically had, what it is. We had over fifty bottles of wine open going back to 02. We didn't start making Pinot Gris until the mid two thousand uh, until about two thousand. Because it was an accident coming to the vineyard. Yeah, we hadn't really originally intent out intent on making it, but we had commercial vintages of Chardonnay back to 02 and Pinot Noir back to 02. A bottle from each vintage open for people to taste. So they go at least 10 years is what we tell everybody. And just for our customers to see that, then we open up the old ones so mm -hmm. that they can. And just for Valentine's Day, we just opened up an 03 Chardonnay. People don't know that the Chardonnays can go that long. They're shocked. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They get better. It's all the way that it's made, mm -hmm. and we're just anal about all that stuff. So it's cleanliness and keeping it tightly sealed and reductive uh, wine making, not a lot of oxygen exposure, no pumping. And no we just up. he's just had those ideas ever since uh, graduate school. Mm -hmm. But but probably the more important part, uh, I mean, the winemaking is basically sanitary engineering, but the important part is really. I mean, I, we've made bad wine from bad grapes. Not, not at this site, but in the Yeah, in the mostly it's life. the grapes. If you don't, I mean, we, this is farmed organically, it's dry farmed, and it's meticulously groomed by our guys. And um, if we get good material into the winery, it's pretty, honestly, pretty hard to screw it up. Hmm. I mean, you can. And it's most, not that hard. Yeah. <laughs> it's it, happened. Well, winemaking, in my opinion, winemaking is equal parts watchful waiting. It's babysitting. It, you, it, it's not like, okay, we'll just walk away and that'll get better in six I'll months. I'll be back in six months. You have to constantly be checking and putting your nose in things and tasting and monitoring and paying attention and running lab tests and doing all this stuff and then not doing anything. I mean, you have to do stuff when it's necessary to do stuff. We're in the process right now, Blake's over there. Mm -hmm. uh, of the 18? Restarting a couple of whites that didn't quite get dry. We do, um, all of our ferments are native yeast, and we've, about every five or six, maybe eight years, we'll get a Pinot Gris or a Chardonnay that won't go fully dry, mm -hmm. and we have to go back in and restart it. Mm -hmm. That's He's doing that right now. Mm -hmm. But we waited and waited and waited. I mean, our Chardonnays, a, a normal year, they'll ferment primary fermentation for eight, nine, ten months. Yeah, they, they stay in the cellar because really it's cold slow, down there. Really slow, really uh, high lease content. Uh, yeah. I, I, I think that in some, to some degree, we're sort of replicating the old school, not that we're making Burgundy here by any means, these are Oregon wines, but we're replicating some of the old traditions mm -hmm. that were evident in Europe, yeah. where in Burgundy, they're more continental climate, they're cold in the winter time, we have a cold cellar, we purposely keep it the cave cold, we bring in cold night air so that we cool everything down and we slow everything down. And it's an old saw that drink no wine before your time, who was it, Orson Welles, who used to do those ads, I think, for Gallo, which were <laughs> kind of nonsense, but that patient winemaking is important. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, uh, one of my pet phrases is, fast food and fast wine have a lot in common. They aren't the best. Mm -hmm. And uh, we've been fortunate that we've had the patience and the resources and the time, although we're getting too darn old to be doing this as actively as we do, but we've had the time to be patient with our wine and wait and let it fully develop. Mm -hmm. Well, we didn't at first. You just want to, you just, you know, you, um, the first year we got um, the grapes and you've got your barrels and uh, you can't wait mm -hmm. to see what it tastes like, but it's too early. Yeah. 
there's no way to tell. You've got to give it. I think if if I could say what we've learned the most is patience. We had some one, young winemakers up here this weekend, and I could, I, in talking with them, I could, I could just, I could oh. see myself again, oh, yeah. back in in my twenties, wanting to taste the wine before it was ready, yeah. Yeah. and wanting to bottle the wine before it was ready, and wanting it, wanting to hurry it. And along, there's no way to along, tell. You know. We've had years where um, we'll go taste the wines, and it's like, oh, whoa. Uh, it used to really scare us, like, oh my God, what have we done wrong this time, right? But what we should do is just trust the vineyard. That really needs to be p painted in there. That's our theme. <laughs> it's our theme, trust the vineyard, because you'll go back s six months later and, oh, there you are. Mm -hmm. you, you came back. <laughs> it goes through so many phases that, uh, and, it, and if you give it years, that's even better. But... Um, yeah, we've had, we have enough years now. We can go years, and, and, and it, it it's better. And you make you make mistakes along the way, or you have tough vintages. I mean, I can think of like two thousand and five. I we had a challenging vintage that year, and I ended up overpressing the Pinot. And it tastes like and that. It was it was too tannic for a long time because I just over extracted it, and. I kept telling people, just wait, just wait, just wait, and I finally got to the point where I was kind of, it was kind of hard to say it anymore because it wasn't getting better, it wasn't getting better, and it finally did. In fact, we had David Miller, who worked here for quite a while. I think it was his Yeah, but how old finish. is that? How old is that one? Well, 2000. Until you can finally drink 10 it. 10 years. <laughs> it's like, yeah. 2011. Uh, uh, when we get the better equipment that we buy, the mm -hmm. differences start to well, happen, too, all that all stuff. 2011 was a tough finish. And, um, you know, it was hard to get grapes ripe, and it was a late harvest, and uh, the, the wines at first were very... And I don't think we're the only wineries tight, that have that right, hard to, <clears throat> hard issue. To, hard to sell, and people, I mean, people that trust us that we've sold a lot of wine to for a lot of years would say, you know... What did you send what us? Did, what did you do with this wine? What is this? We'd this say, isn't just you? Wait, just wait, you know, it's going to come, just give it some time, give it some time. And it's, it's been gratifying. I mean, in the last six months or so, we've had a couple of our old time term customers, you know, pull that 11 out of the, out of their cellar and say, do you have any more? Mm -hmm. Can you send me a case? Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, it's, mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's challenging at times and you think you've learned it all and then you get thrown a curve. This last vintage, 2019, was a tough year for a lot of folks. There were people here in the Dundee Hills, and I don't know the names of the Yeah, they lost their vineyards. Who lost crop mm -hmm. this year due to powdery mildew. Mm -hmm. And Rudy and I, uh, our our theme this summer was, uh, we don't want to, we don't want to have 2005 over again because that was a year we had a lot of mildew in the vineyard, and we really had to deal with it. Um, we had to do things like shorten up our spray cycles and and being being small um, makes that a little bit easier. Mm -hmm. And one guy dedicated to bringing up one grape and saying, "Oh my God, it's starting!" Yeah, I, I see mean, it. he's just like that. Mm -hmm. Thank he's goodness. I, I don't know what we'd do if we didn't have him. Yeah. Um, Thirty years of farming this ground has also taught us where we're going to find it first. You know, you know it's going to show up in Chardonnay before it shows up anywhere else. Mm -hmm. You know that if it's getting into the Pinot Noir at all, which is horrifying, uh, it'll be there's a kind of a gully down at the bottom of the mm -hmm. slope here where we always scout through there extra carefully. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you, you learn things about your vineyard. Mm -hmm. You're not going to see it on the end rows. It's going to be in the middle of the row, which puts me on my soapbox about planting rose bushes at the end of the rose. That's not where mildew starts, folks. <laughs> starts in the middle. But uh, they, they're pretty, and that's a, right, <laughs> that's a good reason to plant roses. But <laughs> you better be out there scout, scouting your plant, your, your grape plants, not your, not your roses. So you talked about um, small production. And you talked about kind of going, back, kind of reverting back to a direct to consumer post recession. So tell me mm -hmm. about kind of with the small production and with the fact that you two are 
involved in all of that? Uh, you, you're doing most of the selling, you're doing most of the meeting customers. Tell me about the kind of the, the tasting room model, the what, what a customer's experience when they're buying wine from you and what are you kind of, what are you trying to sell here and what is their reaction to the way you're doing things? We um, are pr really very famous for doing uh, verticals. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of tasting rooms don't do verticals. So we have, um, say, three to four years of uh, Chardonnay, Dijon clone Chardonnay, and uh, the Pinot. Um, we'll have one year usually of the Pinot Gris because we have less than an acre of it. It just sells out faster. Uh, but people love to go through the different years. One of the things we've discovered with the, the wine club model is that people appreciate getting multiple vintages mm -hmm. so we can actually kind of curate our inventory and you know if the CFO were running this business they would tell you you need to accelerate your cash flow turn turn over your older inventory faster all that sort of stuff but we also understand that our wines develop rather slowly and that that they don't reach their peak upon release so we have an opportunity to give our customers a more fully developed bottle of wine and a variety so they're not getting you know if they get a case of wine they're not getting all one vintage they're getting a variety mm -hmm. and we can manage our inventory in such a way that we've got multiple vintages and we can pour those multiple vintages and give people we like our, we like to do our tastings as kind of an educational mm -hmm. thing where we talk about the fact that these are from the same vines they're made the same way we don't radically change our wine making the same people are making the wine that have always made the wine here um, it's on the same place, you know, it's all, it's all, we've controlled as many of the variables as we possibly can. And so what you're yeah. probably tasting is Oregon's vintage variation and the weather that year. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes we even shortcut it and say we bottle Oregon's weather and you're tasting it. Mm -hmm. And they can imagine that and we talk about each one. Um, the um, important uh, part about tasting all those different years is that they um, and the way that we manage selling it is people their comments are you're selling library wines because mm -hmm. we've got four out there these aren't library yet they're available at the they are available at the, and it's all the same price mm -hmm. all the Chardonnay is the same price all the Pinot is the same price um, one of the things we pride like ourselves that. on and we think people enjoy because we hear this frequently is that we're real we don't stop doing wine work when they're here in fact we have people up here tasting during harvest and we just staff for that and try to manage it in such a way that they get some of the real experience if we're bottling the bottling line's running while they're tasting mm -hmm. uh, and, and we used to stop people doing the wait. tastings are wendy um blake uh cliff or i um, everybody's involved and they know all the answers uh, there it's not a it's not a typical tasting room and I can really say our customers love that in fact sometimes when they're coming to pick up their wines for club they request that whoever they want be there to serve them um, that's kind of hard to do sometimes and they'd be good with any of us uh, it's, re it's real high touch but it's also buried in the in the guts of this business is high-tech mm -hmm. and the high-tech part of it I we have to credit uh, our software developer uh, who uh, has a PhD in software engineering and is an absolute genius and works at a pretty high level at Google right now and also happens to be our son-in-law. <laughs> yeah, because he came to he came and helped us, like when they lived in Hillsboro. Yeah, um, he, he, he would come and help us during the openings and stuff. And he goes, "You guys, I can really help you." <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty helpful. Thank goodness you are son-in-law. <laughs> so, you can, you can, good. So you guys need to go. Or oh no, no. Oh, oh, okay. If you need the restroom, it's right there. Yeah. Um, what one of the things we discovered as we started this wine club journey is doing it pencil and paper up to yeah. about 50 i could pretty much do it by hand yeah they'd call and say what their number was and it was like oh my god where you know start i could pull out well we'd have them numbered right hand. but oh no but we uh now we, we can push a button and it all goes it, it's all over the united states the yeah the 
the sure. whole management of the wine club thing with this custom built software that Tyler designed for us is we couldn't be so hands-on without the high tech in the background because the amount of management we have to do of that software is minimal. Mm -hmm. And it's all out on the cloud, so it's accessible to us remotely. I mean, if we're, at a, if we're at a Ducks good. game and somebody wa wants to ask us a question via email, we can look up their records and, you know, it's right there. It, it, it really allows us to be more present for our customers. Mm -hmm. um, it's It's been great. It's really, really... We couldn't we couldn't manage hundreds of people in a wine club without that software helping us and we you know we, it's just good it's yeah, really really and, good. Yeah, uh, and Wendy does all the shipping and all the stuff now. We used to do all that. Uh, people are, uh, but we're able to do it because we got that software. And we have so really good, good really good folks like Wendy and like Blake and, and mm -hmm. helping us with it. Because I used to do the books. I mean, I used to be pretty good at QuickBooks. I well, wrote to all the text. He'd go up there and just, you know, you couldn't talk to him for days because <laughs> he had to input everything, you know. Well, in, run, in running a business, one of the things you don't often realize is the amount of clerical work and the amount of just book work and, and, and yeah. record keeping yeah. and management stuff you have to do. Um, and I used to do pay payroll, and that's crazy. Um, so Wendy, well, Wendy does everything, so I'm just saying. Yeah. <laughs> and what Wendy all that does, and Blake, so we can have a conversation now. And Blake's over, Blake's over working on, uh, on the wines. We sat, had a meeting this morning and talked about these two tanks of Chardonnay and this one tank of Pinot Gris that we've run numbers on and we have a sense that there's a little bit of residual sugar in there that we need to resolve and which ones to do and how to do it and now he's over there doing yeah, we the work. Really, and we really don't mind waiting on the customers. Uh, we both come from a sales background and um, uh, I, I love it when I see old friends mm -hmm. coming mm -hmm. uh, to pick up the wines and such because it um, I almost, when I see them, they're coming and I'm not going to be there, that's almost upsetting for me. <laughs> Just friends, you know. One, one of the things that I learned in my business career, because I was doing pretty high level consulting in a lot of pretty high powered organizations, and the thing I'd see the marketing people particularly do, because they're promoters, is that the grass was always greener and they wanted to attract new customers that they were always focused on how to get new business. Mm -hmm. And there was a guy named Roger Best at the University of Oregon that um, wrote some, did some interesting research on this and it, it, it really resonated with what I saw in working in business and also with a lot of my research was that oftentimes in marketing and in business, your best sales opportunity is your existing customer. Mm -hmm and that people oftentimes are looking for that new customer and neglecting the customer they have. Mm -hmm. And we try as hard as we can to be there for them. be there for these for our existing customers and help them stay connected with us. And yeah, when uh, we have our important. we have a yearly uh, club event and it's hard for Cliff and I to not to pay attention to um, the flowers or the this or the that or the other because the people are lined up to talk to us. We made the uh, mistake one year of allowing a hundred and about a hundred and thirty people up here. Wendy allows me to talk to people. <laughs> Just go talk to the people. We we, we <laughs> okay. didn't we didn't put a limit on the number of folks we could have uh, as we put a limit but it wasn't as low as it should have been. We had too many people up here and we really felt like it didn't work as mm -hmm. well at that number so we, we cut cap it, it at a hundred. Mm -hmm. Fifty couples. And mm -hmm. that way we can make sure that we have a personal interaction with everyone. Mm -hmm. And the people that are helping us too. Pausing just a second. Oh, did it come off? Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's totally we fine. could go right up here if that's easier. Yeah. Yeah. Just so you have something to hang on to. Yeah. So as 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 with that, I'm I'm curious. Um, we, we talked that earlier about nice. when you when you started making wine, when you had your property in Happy mm -hmm. Valley, you weren't real sure about this whole wine industry thing if it was gonna if it was gonna take off. But by, by the time you bought in. Obviously, enough had changed that you were confident in, in trying what you, what you did. What, what are the what are the biggest changes you've seen? What, what, at what point did you decide this actually is an industry that we can be successful in that can be successful a uh, successful thing in Oregon? I think the key has been how slow we've gone. Mm -hmm. We weren't in a rush, 
And I've loved that fact because we didn't just do it all at once. Well, the quality improvement in the industry has been dramatic, and a lot of it is due to the transition that the, the original folks here, the Ponzi's, the Adelsheim's, the Sokoblossers, the Dickey Raths, the, the early folks, didn't come into this knowing what they were doing, honestly. They overcropped Pinot Noir and made stuff that, that wasn't a respectable rosé out of six to eight tons to the acre. And they learned from their experience instead of following that path. They went back and said, okay, we've got to keep improving. And they, there was that early collegial atmosphere was super powerful to getting us to the point where, in my opinion, we make the best Pinot Noir in the world by and large here. And, and also a big factor in that history is the French. Mm -hmm. um, uh -huh. How uh, they either got mad at us for being in competition well, they got with mad them. Mad California mostly. They mad and just shut us off. Or, huh, you guys can grow Pinot? I'm coming over and buying some property. <laughs> The smart ones. The, the germs, so, the germs you know. coming in was a giant, giant thing, and and the rest, and the French influence has been largely positive. I, I largely tend to, positive. I tend to struggle a little bit with the idea that we're trying to duplicate Bur Burgundy here. We've spent a lot of time in Burgundy. We spent a lot of time in New Zealand. We've been in South America tasting Pinot Noir. This is a special place. We make special wine here. We need to make Oregon wine. We can learn from other places, but, but I'm on a soapbox about really stressing that what we do here is Oregon. Yes. We're not Burgundy. We're yes. not California, and we're not New Zealand. This is, this is its own special place, and honestly, in all the world, I think some of the best fruits and vegetables grow here in the Willamette Valley, and that translates into wine grapes, and it translates into wine. Yeah, if we can have a good tomato year, we're going to get good grapes. Mm -hmm. Just well, for the years, we've just realized that, I, you know? I want to talk a little bit, real quickly, about one thing we hear frequently from our visitors. Mm -hmm. A lot of our people that come here, folks that stay at the Allison, for example, are sophisticated world travelers. They've been to Napa. They've been to France. They've been to Italy. They've been to Argentina. They've been to you know. They've been around the world, and particularly the ones that used to have used to have a habit of going to California every year or every other year. The message that they frequently communicate to us is don't become Napa. We hear that all the time. Stay Oregon. We love how genuine it is here. It's more like Dry Creek, Sonoma. It's not, we haven't turned into Disneyland yet. There are There's projects in the world. Some that are I'm, trying to. I'm aware of some that are, that are not out there in the public yet that we're building a house in Newburgh right now. And, uh, one of the uh, subs that's working on it had a drawing on his phone of a new project that's in the planning stage and our builder looked at it and he's not even, he's a Mormon he looked at it and he said it looks like Disneyland and so we're seeing more of that and I a lot uh, of money come into the I, area I don't I don't think we can I, I don't know of any way logically or otherwise we can sort of stop that change you know it's just I feel like I'm a little a yeah little unless you own the property there's nothing you can do or, or, or just want to be stuck in time but I think it's important that we remember how we got here and I think it has a lot to do with land use planning even though we got stuck in a situation with the urban growth boundary where uh, our farming operation wasn't sustainable I still very much believe that we've got to, that old Tom McCall stuff, that we've got to protect the countryside, we've got to keep rural areas rural, that if we get too... It, it, it's kind of easy to kill what it is that makes Oregon, Oregon, if we don't respect what it is that we have here. The population of the state since we moved here has tripled. Yeah. And we're the kind of the early people in the California influx. Mm -hmm. We came up when everybody down there said, you'll be back in six months. Yeah, it's one, like it always one, rains one up winter. there. Yeah. yeah. Um, we never went back. No. <laughs> no. So what do you see as you look into the future for Oregon wine? What do you see as you look a decade down the road here? It's just getting better as far as the quality. Mm -hmm. 
um, of not every winery, but um, I I think I think it's challenging. It's going to be increasingly challenging. It already is to differentiate a new operation and a small operation when you're in a milieu with 800 wineries. When it was two dozen, uh, you were pretty unique and, and stood out from the rest. But there's a lot of Me Too out there, so I don't know what's going to happen. I mean, I could see a period where we go through a lot of consolidation and it becomes more, uh, more uh, it's sort of like the mom and pop grocery store kind of went away when the supermarket came in. And I wonder if that isn't potentially the future of, uh, of what we're going to see here in Oregon. And it's not one I relish. I, you know, I'm an old guy now and, and I kind of like, I thought things were really great back in the 90s and the early 2000s. And it's kind of like it's getting a little bit bigger and more, uh, you know, it's, this is not... This is not what the Oregon Wine Board necessarily would want me to be saying, yeah. but I yeah. don't really like the idea of it becoming more like Napa and, and larger operations. I, yeah. I think there's a, a great sense of collegiality and community and uh, ownership and, and genuine warmth that comes from the small family farm. Mm -hmm. And I, I hate to see that go away. I remember after we named this place Anderson Family Vineyard, uh, about five years later, I walked into a Fred Meyer store and I saw Gallo Family Vineyard on an end aisle display. And I'm going, <laughs> Gallo, you guys make your own bottles down in Modesto. You're not, you're not a farm. <laughs> you're a factory. I mean, in a lot of ways, they are they are a farm, and I I, I acknowledge the contribution of the Gallos to the wine well, world. But you know, and when we first started. All we talked about was how are we going to, um, uh, when wine started getting better, uh, how are we going to get people here, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So um, they weren't doing the best job of getting people to come to the Willamette Valley. Um, do we have anything to complain about now that the they've Austin's been successful did such a with that? Job with the Allison, and they, uh, you know, having more lodging options for people is a wonderful thing that I hope we see in the future. You know, I, I'm not a golfer, but I think if we had a destination resort with a golf course out here somewhere, I think that would be, mm -hmm. uh, if it was done appropriately, tastefully, and respectfully to the area, I think that would be a good thing for the wine industry, at least the way we operate within the wine industry. Um, and how, uh, is there room for everybody? Who knows? I, it's just like anything that grows like this, yeah, I think. I think Happy there Valley is room did for it. Everybody. I'm not sure there's room for 2,000 brands. Mm -hmm. You know, that, that worries me a little bit that, that you start, and, and you also, perhaps, there's a risk of losing a bit of the quality message as we start trying to produce more Pinot Noir, more, more Oregon labeled wines for under $20. Uh, you know, that may be $25 at some point. I mean, I, I'm a business guy. I come from a, a fairly good finance background. We price our wines about a, as aggressively as we can to survive as a small winery. So, you know, I don't know what happens with mass production. I don't know what happens to the long-term Oregon franchise that's quality, hands-on, small producer care, you know, we start to homogenize it a little bit, it starts to be less, mm -hmm. less Oregon. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I wor we worry about that. Mm -hmm. I, I, I worried when I saw what Bill and uh, Sam and company, Cheryl, um, A to Z. Michael, all those guys were doing up at A to Z. Now, they've done a good job, I think, of implementing that strategy, and they haven't compromised our brand quality here in Oregon, but... I don't know that that's always going to be true. And when we're selling grapes to California and they get labeled as Willamette Valley, I don't know what that does to us. Mm -hmm. there, it's, it, there's a bit of concern. What about the future here for you at Anderson Family? What are you, what are you hoping for as you look ahead? That's a good question. Um, our kids have their own lives. Um, 
we've got good help and good people and we've seen other folks in the industry go for a long time so we're still running half marathons and hanging in there i don't i don't know how much <laughs> longer that's going to be true but yeah. as long as uh, we're having fun and we're i mean we're making some changes we're in the process of building we live here most of the time even though we still got the house in happy valley um we're building a house in downtown Newburgh that the theme of the house is aging in place. So we plan on staying in the area. We're not going away, <laughs> but we're not going to live over the, over the shop forever. So we're moving out of here. We're going to sell the house in Happy Valley. Uh, the house that we built, our building in Newburgh is the exact opposite of our 135 year old Victorian <laughs> farmhouse. It's very modern, very square very industrial it looks like a new car dealership <laughs> uh, and that's intentional we wanted to do something different mm -hmm. there's very little wood in it it's all concrete and and uh, and so what are you gonna do with the winery keep going yeah um, we don't have any plans for um, changing things a lot we we are hiring more people to help us mm -hmm is what I, what I'd say was, we used to do everything. So we know how. I mean, everything. <laughs> everything. The janitor, I mean, we have some that we still do that to uh, some degree. Our, our vineyard guys are getting older, they're not gonna be able to run forever. Mm -hmm. The degree to which we're able to work seven days a week, 60 hour, 50 hour weeks, I mean, we, we get tired easier. So those things, we're gonna either successfully groom and develop people to be able to do that kind of stuff or we may ultimately have to find another solution which could mean that we have to solve somebody. Uh, our grandkids aren't excited about that idea. They tear up when we say we're say we, <laughs> we don't know what we're going to do when we're 80 um, and that's not that far off. But uh, it's the work is really hard. <laughs> but one thing and so that's where our kids went off, you know, got their educations and went, bye, <laughs> see you later. <laughs> we, we realize that the only way you can do a business like this is, is if you're passionate. You about have to it. have the passion. And both of our daughters are very successful in what they do. The older daughter's a lawyer and the other daughter's a, a business manager and a mom right now and, you know, they're both they're both doing their own things and they both help us a lot around here they continue to but it's not their thing mm -hmm. and we're not going to shoehorn a grandkid or a, one of our children into saying you know guilt them into taking responsibility for for owning this place because it's if, been our passion yeah they they've been through the whole thing with us and the biggest um, going back to when we bought this the biggest overwhelming emotion I had when I realized we could own this property was kind of a, dread isn't quite the right, right word, but a profound respect for the stewardship. Good we, stewards. We think this is a pretty special piece of ground. I mean, people that come up here from all over the world are, are, and I'm sure every winery has visitors that love being there and it's a wonderful outdoors experience, but this has an exceptional view. For example, the UPS driver who goes to every winery in the valley says we have the best view in the valley. And uh, he parks and has lunch. Yeah, and says you ought to charge me to come up here. <laughs> so no, it's okay as long as you say uh, good things about us. <laughs> so, so our first feeling when we bought this was one of intense responsibility to make sure we didn't screw it up. Building these buildings on top of a hill up here, we could have easily thrown up some kind of sore thumb Tuscan chateau. And we cons consciously, I mean, we had great architectural advice. A guy that used to work for, was the second in command for Mies van der Rohe was our main architect on this. Yeah, if you know, Mies van der Rohe was pretty famous, maybe only uh, second in famousness to Frank Lloyd Wright, uh, American architecture back in the 50s um, and 60s, uh, was, was advised us on the design, but we, we all thought of having this look like Oregon, to be Oregon, to be reflective of the deep roots here in the Willamette Valley, and, and uh, that means a lot to us. Mm -hmm. 
And I think we would have bought a lot more land at the beginning because we were a lot younger. I would have. I'm so, yeah, he was already doing it and I said, no, I, <laughs> you're not. I no. started out trying to buy the property over here and the property Yeah, he over was just there. like asking everybody, got your land for sale? She was, she was like, lit. no, let's, let's just stay, let's learn this first. Allison had the wisdom to say, you know, we just need to really take good care and of it. And enjoy this because he already owned that market research company with 200 people or whatever. We just needed to be slower. It'd be, yeah. it'd be okay, but it's hard to take your foot off the gas <laughs> when you're doing it your whole life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think you've learned pretty well to back off. Still learning. Yeah, I know, you're still learning. It's true. It actually leads really well into my, my last question for you guys today, which is, what is the secret for a successful marriage in the, uh, Oregon, in the Oregon wine industry? <laughs> oh boy. <laughs> Well, we've been married 47 years, so uh, we knew each other as kids. This, this is going to sound kind of corny, but um, it's not different than, than wine, making wine. It's just on a longer scale, patience <laughs> with each other and going through the hard times. I mean, you know, being in a partnership and being in a marriage for that long a time. We went to the same high school. Um, yeah, we don't have to explain anything to each other because we came from the same background. Mm -hmm. I think that's really, you know, that First doesn't mean that doesn't mean that you realize. can do a winery. And I think we do have the same passions. That's the other thing. We both want um, it to be uh, the winery to be um, a lot of um, perfections going on, uh, and we couldn't do it any other way. We couldn't do it any other way. So we believe the same way that way. Um, and we just keep going. I, you know, having been around this industry for quite a long time, I think you see that those partnerships either get tighter or, and there was especially a lot of this early on, or you see them split up. And I don't know if it's 50-50 or 60-40, which way it is, but you know, there's a lot. Of this, there's a lot of rock star stuff that goes on here. There's a lot of um, ego crap. There's a lot of hard work. There's a lot of pain and suffering, and that's hard on a marriage. And it can make. Uh, yeah. You, you can. You know, it, it's a business, and running a business together, what you essentially have to do as a small winery, is hard on a marriage. Can be. Well, you either um, get, get stronger, you, you can come apart. I think what we're saying is just true about any long marriage. Pretty much. <laughs> you know, when you have your. I came from a background of uh, a lot of divorces and such. So every time we'd have a fight at the beginning, it was like, okay, I'm out of here. <laughs> I'm out of here. I'm not, you know, I'm not hanging around for this. And he'd go, we're going to actually talk about this. <laughs> we're going to actually work it out. Calm down, you know, <laughs> and that's worked because mm -hmm. it was like, oh, you're not going to just walk away too, mm -hmm. you know. That you're pretty young, and you um, you need to make, when you make those decisions to do that, you need to pay attention to um, how important that is mm -hmm. to work it out. Yeah, simple terms. I can't imagine Commit starting over now. <laughs> Can you imagine oh. starting over? It's like, oh, <laughs> <laughs> no. Yeah. Well, thank you both so much for your time today, for your oh, answers. Thanks for, for your, asking. For your <laughs> history. Yeah. Um, uh, is there anything I should have asked that I didn't, anything we didn't cover that we should have covered? Actually, actually, there's one more thing I want to ask. Never mind that. You mentioned the Pinot Gris. I, I want to know how you ended up with Pinot Gris here because I was- The accident? Yes, I want to know about the Pinot Gris accident. Uh, well, we lost some uh, Pinot, uh, a Chardonnay, Dijon Clon Chardonnay plants. You lose them every year. We're always replanting. And right over here uh, is Chardonnay up here on the top. That's some of the driest, rockiest place. So some of the best lost spots. And um, so we we uh, a tray comes from the uh, nursery, and it's labeled Dijon Clon Chardonnay. You don't know; it's just sticks. You know, there's no. And w even if there even if there were some leaves on it. It's pretty hard to tell the differences in the grapes. So you go we ahead and plant no them. We had no reason to suspect it was anything else. Yeah, we go ahead and plant them interspersed, wherever we'd lost. Mm -hmm. And then at three years later, 
three years later, you walk down the road and goes like, that one isn't Chardonnay. And that one over there isn't Chardonnay way down. You know, it's like, oh, they sent us the wrong plants. Richard, all of you have probably seen Pinot Gris growing. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a mutation of Pinot Noir. And it's pretty dark. Mm -hmm. it's, mm -hmm. it's not Chardonnay. Yeah, it, yeah, exactly. So we uh, picked it separately, made it, and the family really um, liked it. Uh, and it's different than the other two that we're serving. My first reaction. And it's was, the best grapes that grow around here. I don't want. We were to curious add, about it. I don't. I don't want to add a third varietal. It's enough work. As no, it we is. didn't want to. I don't want to make Pinot Gris. No, we didn't want to. And but I made some just as an experiment. And then yeah. I then I, I in business spent a lot of time working in Europe, and I was hanging around a lot um, in Holland because I was doing some work for Phillips. And I couldn't get the Dutch to work on the weekends, and I would be there for like three weeks sometimes. So I'd go down to Alsace and hang out down there uh, on the weekends. I'd rent a car and go down to Alsace. I got to know some of the winemakers down there. Was, I was around really good Pinot Gris. And so I learned a little bit about what they were doing and also learned that it could make a better wine than sometimes we're seeing we're see, we see with people that are using you know, it as a cash it in the crop supermarket for less than ten dollars a bottle and making it either too sweet or too fast or something mm -hmm. uh, you know so we we take as much care of it as we yeah. do anything else. yeah and then one of the things he said was uh if i can make an alsatian pinot gris we're on and so these are lasting ten, at least 10 years and we're also if you can wait five years if you can be patient enough which nobody is uh you can get like a dry Riesling viscous uh, fusel flavor. Yeah, we've had some of our older older some of them do that. start to taste like a like a really good Mosul. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, they've got that kind of that fusel oil character and some other stuff going on, which I never had really tasted mm -hmm. in Pinot Gris. It surprised no. me. Yeah, so uh, we're excited that we've got one that does that. Mm -hmm. It's it's fun. We have no idea what clone we have or anything because of the way it got here. Yeah, exactly. What a happy accident. <laughs> yeah, it's like that unwanted child that turned out to be your best. <laughs> I've got one of those. <laughs> better not say that for tape. <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> that was just a joke. <laughs> Aaron, that was a joke. <laughs> no. Well, thank you both. Is there is there anything else I should have asked that I didn't cover or anything else you'd like to say here at the end? No, I think you've heard everything about you, us. You've let us pretty much free range and, and uh, yeah, yeah. that's good. Awesome. Well, thank you both so much. We really do appreciate this. Yeah. And we'll go ahead and let you off, off the hook.